Hello, everyone, and welcome to the session uh, with uh, Auto Ninja Academy. Today's topic is compartment syndromes, and I hope you're going to enjoy this session. Uh, I'm Rahil Sharif. I'm an orthopedic consultant, uh, previously at Manchester University Hospital and currently in Jeddah. I've got with me uh, Amir Shoaib, a friend and a colleague. Amir, hi. Hi, Rahil. Hi, everybody. Uh, welcome to uh, today's webinar. Um, it's a controversial subject compartment syndrome, and I've got to say that um, it's still something that makes me feel very nervous uh, when you know my resident sort of says that they're worried about someone with compartment syndrome. Uh, so there's a lot of controversy, a lot for us to talk about, and hopefully uh, everyone will be able to take something away with them that they'll find useful in their practice. I think controversial. So shall we start off by looking at a case? Sure. So uh, we've got a case, uh, and we're going to have some polls uh, as we normally do. Mm -hmm. So the whole point of this is that you can um, take part in the poll, and we don't know who's voted for whichever option. So there's no pressure, there's no humiliation, there's no embarrassment. You just vote, say what you think, and then hopefully you'll be able to learn something from uh, the result and get an idea about what everyone else is thinking as well. So this is our first case. It's a 23-year-old man. He's been to the gym and he's using free weights and he's unfortunately dropped one of the weights onto his foot. Um, and you can see in that clinical picture, you know, his foot's looking a bit red, a bit swollen, and there is a bit of bruising around the uh, toes as well. So, um, let's move on to the next slide and he's got multiple fractures of the phalanges and uh, he's in a lot of pain so much pain that it's bringing him to tears and um, obviously it's uh, something that's very concerning uh, because you're worried that he's in so much pain it's disproportionate to the injuries that he appears to have so your resident says I'm worried about compartment syndrome. Can you get compartment syndrome in your foot? So you've got Thanks. a poll going. We'd like you to answer that question. Uh, when uh, Amir started off by saying that uh, it's a controversial topic, that's quite an understatement because when we were off air, a couple of minutes before we started, uh, we realized how divergent we are in our management of uh, these cases. Um, I'd like to think I'm old school. Uh, I'm not sure about Amir. <laughs> So, Amir, do you think compartment syndrome exists in the foot? Absolutely, absolutely. So, so if you think about what compartment syndrome is, you know, it's pressure, uh, increased pressure in an osteofascial compartment, and the foot, like everywhere else in the body, has got osteofascial compartments. So, uh, I think yes, yes, it does exist. What, do you agree that it exists? Um, I do agree it exists, but uh, what we do about it is a different question altogether. Yeah, yeah, okay. Yeah, so let's, let's get to that. Let's move on. So I think everyone's uh, in agreement. So 100% of people who voted have said that they uh, believe that compartment syndrome exists in the foot. Okay, so let's move on to the next picture. So now this is where we're going to get controversial. So the picture show, you can see his x-ray. He's got fractures in the phalanges but he's got compartment syndrome in his foot. So should you decompress the compartments? So I'd like to see how people vote because uh, you know, even amongst ourselves, you know, we can't agree. So there's no right or wrong answer. It's just a question of your own personal opinion and uh, it'd be interesting to see what people think. Seems like you're pushing your Trumpian theories uh, to your uh... Registrars, uh, Mr. Schwab. <laughs> We've got a majority saying they want to decompress. Well, yeah, I, there's a good argument to say they're right. Hmm. What about your fake news that you don't want to decompress? <laughs> right. So uh, I know Amir. Uh, we go a long way back. And uh, Amir is very dedicated to what he does. Uh, the problem now, Amir, is when you go and open that foot up, how are you going to close it? So let's, let's, uh, let's see what the audience are saying. 73% say that they want to decompress the foot. 27%, a third are uh, the minority seem to suggest they don't want to. Uh, 
the issue here is that once you open up that and flay open that foot, um, you're going to have problems closing it. 50% of patients have neurological problems and 65% uh, of patients have wound complications uh, and almost 40% require plastics input. So the, the argument for not opening that foot is that let's say, for example, the patient develops compartment syndrome and then has, what's the worst that's going to happen? He's going to end up with clotos. So it's easier to deal with clotos and straighten them out than put him through that morbidity of uh, flaying open that foot. So that's the argument for not opening that foot up. Let's see what uh, Mr. Shoaib's uh, well, comeback there is. Right, well, um, I would say that I agree with a lot of what you've said. Um, if there were um, fractures uh, that were exposed, uh, that would be exposed by do, performing a fasciotomy, and you know, to, in order to perform fasciotomies, you need to make dorsal incisions to decompress the uh, interossei. And so if there were fractures underlying there, then I'd be thinking, well, if I perform fasciotomies, then I'm going to be uh, leaving that wound open. There's a risk, or it's 100% chance of it being colonized. And that means that there's a substantial risk that um, it might get infected and especially if I put metal work in to fix the underlying fractures, then I'd be concerned. But because uh, it's a soft tissue injury, um, yes, you're right that performing fasciotomies could result in uh, uh, neurological symptoms afterwards, but equally um, the compartment syndrome itself, because of that increased pressure, the, some of the first structures that are affected by compartment syndrome are the nerves. So there is actually a risk as well of, uh, I would say a higher risk if you don't decompress, of damage to the nerves. And that could in, in itself um, uh, cause morbidity for the patient in the future. So, um, but with these phalangeal fractures, you know, I can still wire these fractures and I'm not exposing the fractures through the uh, fasciotomy wounds. So that's my argument that um, I uh, can decompress without causing uh, any exposure of uh, any fractures and I can keep the foot elevated. And yes, it might need uh, a split screen graft later on, uh, but I may actually be able to close these wounds once this swelling has uh, gone down and I don't have the mobility in the future uh, you know, from the nerves or from the, the clawing of the toes. So it's a question of taking a choice about what um, morbidity you, you want uh, after you know, a condition like this. So for this particular problem, I'm going to say I would decompress because I think that there's uh, no additional, well, there's less additional risk from performing that procedure. But you know, it, it's it's one of these things where there's no right or wrong answer, and everybody's got opinions. Uh, and I think that we're going to agree to disagree on this one. I think you're absolutely right there, uh, Amir. Uh, so you can see there's a lot of controversy already. Where we're less than ten minutes into this topic, uh, I'll let you carry on. Okay, so. We're going to change the situation a bit. So I'm going to change the x-ray. So before, um, the fractures were in the phalanges. Now the fractures are in the metatarsals. So the question I'd like you to answer is, should I decompress the compartments now? So, so there are obviously let, let, let's, some let's, people while, while they're answering the question, uh, let's uh, find out how much more we differ. How many compartments in the foot, uh, Anir? Um, I would say there are, I would say there are uh, 10. So uh, we've got um, the interosti. I'm not going to put you on the spot and ask you for the, to name the compartments. So you, you, you're saying <laughs> 10, right? 
Yeah, so see, this is the problem <laughs> for our audience. Some surgeons think they're 10, some think there is that elusive 11th, some think there are nine. So as and a consultant body, before there were four. yeah, exactly, so, the four so, when, yeah. uh, way back in time. Uh, so as a, as a professional body, when we can't seem to agree on how many compartments in the foot, how are we going to successfully decompress all those compartments? That's, that's my point. Yeah, I, I would say that <clears throat> if you can decompress compartments where there are nerves which are at risk, um, then uh, that for me would be uh, a valid uh, sort of way of making a choice. So I'm just right, being so we, I'm we, devil's advocate here. Uh, yeah, yeah, or pushing absolutely. Against, uh, and uh, I mean, the, I suppose the question is, does it make a difference whether a nine or ten or eleven? Absolutely. Um, okay, so let's I see what, today... what the uh, answer to these uh, questions has been. 60% uh, say that they would not decompress because there are metatarsal fractures and you would potentially convert this into an open fracture. 40% say they would. So uh, still a fair split there. But I think the take-home message we're trying to uh, give you is that if there is a fracture in the foot and you're going to be decompressing, you're probably going to end up creating more morbidity and complications, converting it into an open fracture. So you'd rather just bite the bullet, let that patient develop compartment syndrome and deal with the sequelae because uh, it's much easier to do so. Uh, are we in agreement there? Absolutely. Yeah, I agree with you there because um, if you've got claw toes, which is sort of, uh, sort of intrinsic minus foot is sort of the inevitable uh, consequence of uh, compartment syndrome of the foot, um, there aren't that many muscles. There are only the sort of the intrinsic muscles, the flexor hallucis brevis and uh, uh, flexor um, uh, digitorum brevis and the uh, extensor digitorum longus and brevis. Um, so there are not many muscle bellies to die, but they will cause clawing of the toes. Uh, and um, that's something that can be dealt with at a future date. And for me, if there, if there are fractures underlying, I don't really want to risk that excess mobility from converting into open fractures. So I, I agree with you on that one. At least there's something we've found some common ground on. It's just taken us 12 minutes, but we've got there. Okay, shall we move on to the next slide then? So the next question, I mean, on the, the pictures you can see that there's a, this is how I've performed a decompression in the past. Um, and the question, uh, is is it worth measuring compartment pressures because there's a monitor and we could should we use that monitor to uh, measure the compartment pressures and is that helpful for making a decision so so should, so the question is really should I measure the compartment pressures is that going to really make a big difference to how we manage the patient so this is something we're going to tease a little more in, in out uh, during our talk uh, about the use of a compartment pressure monitor. Let's see what the audience says. Over 90% say that they wouldn't use a, a compartment pressure monitoring device. Do you Not agree with them? Um, yes, I, I agree with them. I, I think uh, it's, pure, it's essentially a clinical diagnosis, although a, a pressure monitoring device does have its role to play in certain instances, and we can discuss that uh, later through the course of this uh, uh, discussion. Uh, but from a practical point of view and uh, from real life experience, I think a lot of us wouldn't necessarily use uh, a pressure monitoring system. I, I don't yeah. use it in the foot anyway, because I never decompress the foot, but uh, I put that yeah. question to you. Yeah, so, so I, I, I agree with you on this point, especially the foot. I wouldn't be measuring the compartment pressures. It would be a clinical diagnosis. Um, elsewhere, there's a role but there are uh, logistical problems with being able to use compartment, pr compartment, compartment pressure monitoring effectively. Uh, and uh, I know you're going to be talking about this later, but there are, uh, there are ways of measuring compartment pressure which are helpful, and there are ways which may not be as helpful as you would hope. And um, unless you are going to be able to measure them con continuously, it's really not very helpful. So I wouldn't use compartment pressures, to, especially in the foot, uh, to make a decision about decompression. And in my normal day-to-day -day clinical practice, I wouldn't be using pressures uh, for anywhere, really. 
So, okay. so now that we know that you do decompressive foot, uh, Amir, what are the top two tips you would give uh, us about the, the diagnosis, the clinical signs in the foot? We're not talking of uh, limbs here with the foot. Is it just purely the swelling that makes you say, oops, that looks uh, like a compartment syndrome. I'm going to go and flay that open. Or is there something more to it? I, I think that basically um, uh, swelling on its own is not an indicator for compartment syndrome because you see any patient with a list frank injury, their foot is swollen like a balloon. So you can't really um, uh, assume that if, you, if you've got a very swollen foot, that means that they've got compartment syndrome. Like other areas of the body, it's all down to pain and you know, you've got to uh, assess their pain and their reaction to the response to opiate analgesia and that is really what's going to give you the, the diagnosis if they fail to respond to opiates and splinting with a back slab and elevation then you've got to be concerned that uh, the patient's pain is out of proportion and uh, there's something more going on than just a simple fracture. Okay. So that's the end of that uh, case, isn't it? That's right, yes. Right. What we're going to do is dive into a brief talk on compartment syndrome, uh, specifically looking at a few key uh, topics. So as you found, this is... This is something which is uh, fairly box standard. It's uh, as an orthopedic surgeon, we understand we've got to go and decompress uh, a compartment syndrome. There's no two ways about it. But when it actually comes down to the nitty gritty, uh, you, you do find a lot of humming and eyeing about certain cases. Is this a compartment syndrome? Is it just swelling? So we've got to have a very clear picture in our mind's eye as to what the algorithm is in a diagnosis of a patient with compartment syndrome. What is the pathophysiology? What is the etiology causing this? And what we do to go about dealing with it once we've uh, picked it up. So that's what we're going to uh, focus on in this talk. So here's a question for all of you to start off with. What is the uh, risk of compartment syndrome when you compare open fractures with closed fractures? The options you've got are open fractures have a five-fold increased risk compared to closed. Closed fractures have a five-fold increased risk compared to open, or both have the same risk. So uh, let's give uh, the audience a moment to answer that. Uh, Amir, what are your thoughts? Well, it's quite interesting. Uh, in, we had a discussion uh, about this when we had our first talk on open fractures. Mm -hmm. uh, and um, I, I think we said that open fractures have an increased risk of uh, compartment syndrome because it's simply because it's a, a higher and usually higher energy injury so that's that's my uh, take on it yeah, absolutely i think the audience seems to uh, be a bit divided between uh, both have the same risk and open fractures have a higher risk the right answer to that is as you rightly said open fractures have a much higher incidence of compartment syndrome it's quite counterintuitive because you think that uh, an open fracture, it has decompressed through that uh, wound, but actually the wounds are quite small and the energy imparted in that fracture site is significant, causing a lot more extravasation and bleeding, which uh, gives rise to compartment syndrome. So the incidence of compartment syndrome in a closed fracture is 1%, whilst in open fractures, it's 6%. So it's a significantly increased risk. Okay, so what is compartment syndrome? Let's get these uh, nitty gritties out of the way. Essentially, it's an elevated amount of pressure within a closed myofascial or an osteofacial compartment, wherein the amount of blood coming into that compartment is reduced because there is increased intracompartment pressure, and that gives rise to uh, ischemia and necrosis of the muscle. Um, and what we've found is typically that pressure threshold is 30 millimeters of mercury. So if your intracompartmental pressure goes above 30 millimeters of mercury, then you're bound to end up with uh, muscle ischemia and necrosis. So some key buzzwords and definitions we need to know of. Tissue perfusion pressure is the diastolic blood pressure minus the intracompartmental pressure. And that's essentially the pressure to which the blood perfuses within the tissues. And if we look at the uh, pathophysiology, if you have a direct injury, you end up with extravasation or an arterial bleed, which causes increased uh, edema in that compartment. That gives rise to an increased compartmental pressure which reduces the blood flow, 
and ischemia. Now, a fasciotomy breaks that cycle. Uh, and if you don't do a fasciotomy, you end up with the, the usual uh, classic five Bs. So let's deep dive a little more into that pathophysiological uh, diagram. So here we've got an artery, which breaks down into arterioles. You've got capillaries, venules, and veins. So that's your uh, tree. Now, what tends to happen in a closed compartment is that if you have an injury, there is edema from extravasation, and that starts compressing the venules. That, in turn, causes the stasis within that compartment. There's an increased compartmental pressure because there's those venules which are collapsible are beginning to sort of close because there's fluid in the uh, extracellular fluid which is closing down on those venules. Now, the blood, as we know, flows through the arteries into the arterioles, but because there is that stasis, that gives rise to ischemia, and that's what gives rise to the compartment syndrome. So in, uh, in a very pictorial sense, that essentially is what happens. And this is a, an example which uh, Amer uses, uh, and it's a very nice one to uh, highlight. So think of it like a tire with the outer lining of the tire and then the inner tube, which is the contents of the compartment. Now, if you start blowing up pressure into that inner tube, you're increasing the pressure within that compartment. At some point, that inner tube will go and hit that outer rubber lining. And that's the threshold at which point your compartment uh, syndrome occurs because there's no further expansion space for it and you end up with uh, compartment syndrome. So as we said, it's a vicious cycle, increased bleeding, increased soft tissue injury, gives rise to uh, edema, which increases your compartment pressure. That in turn causes uh, uh, the ischemia. Why does it occur? So the two factors, one, you've either got a decreased compartment size or you've got an increased content within your compartments. It's as simple as that. That's what's going to increase your pressure. You've lowered your compartment size or you've increased the amount of contents within that uh, finite space. What are the examples of a reduced compartment size? You've got constrictive dressings, you know, when you tight, uh, uh, you've got tight dressings around, uh, circumferential dressings around the limb. You've got splints and casts which are put on very tight. And you've got external sustained pressure, maybe a crush injury like that dumbbell on that uh, foot or sustained pressure from um, a, a, a log of wood which has fallen on the patient and the patient's been trapped under that. What increases the uh, content within the compartment? So trauma with edema, vascular injuries with bleeding. Uh, interestingly, in insect and snake bites can give rise to a significant amount of exudation of fluid within a compartment and give rise to compartment syndrome. Uh, intravenous cannulation and extravasation, uh, extravasation of fluid or hypertrophy of muscle, which gives rise to your classic chronic exertional compartment syndrome. So any of these can contribute to your uh, compartment syndrome. And how do we diagnose it? So you've got to have your risk factors in mind. Bear in mind, the odds of a man developing a compartment syndrome are much higher than a, a lady, 10 is to 1. 50% of uh, compartment syndromes tend to occur in tibial fractures. So if you've got to pick a bone, we all know tibial fractures are uh, a high-risk category. And we've discussed the open versus closed fractures. The risk of compartment syndrome is uh, 6 to 11% in forearm fractures. And particularly in uh, the pediatric age group with uh, supracondylar fractures, if you flex the elbow, you've got a much higher chance of uh, developing compartment syndrome when you put a patient in a back slab. So it's probably better to consider putting a patient in a semi-extended back slab than a full, uh, in a flexed uh, posture. <clears throat> so ma male to female ratio is 10 is to 1 for uh, acute compartment syndromes. But when it comes to chronic exertional compartment syndromes, uh, sex doesn't really play a role. So here's a question for uh, all of us. What is the earliest sign in diagnosing a compartment syndrome? Is it uh, increased swelling of the limb, increased girth within limb, pain on passive touch, or loss of two-point discrimination? So we're going to give you a moment to answer that. Uh, Amir, what are your thoughts? <clears throat> well, um, Chris, I'm, I'm wavering. I think swelling um, isn't necessarily important. Uh, for compartment syndrome, because you know, especially like the mm -hmm. deep compartment of the of the, the lower leg, you can't even see it, so you can't tell when there's any swelling there. Uh, pain on passive stretch is certainly very important, um, and uh, you know, I'd be using that as one of my indicators for diagnosing compartment syndrome. I also know that you know in some instances 
uh, loss of nerve function uh, can uh, be um, caused by compartment syndrome and that can be relatively early but um, I think I'm going to go with most of the audience and talk uh, and say pain on passive stretch but I'm not sure if I'm com if I'm right on that so it's interesting 86 percent of our audience seems to think it's uh, pain on passive stretch uh, and that makes sense for us as orthopedic surgeons because that's what was, is drilled into us from a very early uh, uh, age in our training that pain on passive stretch uh, aka compartment syndrome which is true, that's the sign we tend to use. But actually, the loss of two-point discrimination is the earliest sign in picking up a compartment syndrome. Um, so just a, a nugget there for everyone. So we've got this, we've discussed this, five Ps, pain, pallor, paresthesia, pulselessness, and paralysis. We've, we've lost the, you know, the, the, the war before it's even begun, essentially, if we're looking for those uh, signs. So none of those actually are what we're looking for. We're going to go through uh, what the main key signs are, pain, pain, and more pain. Yeah, and the pain, as we've typically described it, as we all know, is out of proportion to the uh, mechanism of injury. There is increased need for analgesics and opiates, and it doesn't really dull the pain, and the passive stretch we've discussed. Two-point uh, light touch is the most sensitive early sign, and the swelling, which is described as typically rock-hard or woody, but you don't really see that in clinical practice. You tend to see firm sort of uh, compartment. A word of caution in the young, don't rely on those typical adult signs. Uh, we talk about three A's in young children, anxiety uh, and increased analgesic use and agitation because they can't really uh, explain their symptoms very, very well to us. So if we've got a suspicion, look for the three A's in uh, children. So here's a on the shop floor step by step uh, algorithm. A lot of us are familiar with it, but it's uh, there's I make no apologies for uh, brushing up once again on this. We've got to have a high index of suspicion. Now, once we've been called in, asked to see a compartment, a possible compartment syndrome, you want to cut all those dressings and that splint down to skin, because as uh, Amir rightly pointed out, that uh, there's an increased compartment pressure just by the circumferential dressings. In fact, uh, there are studies which have shown that. 40% of increase in compartment pressure occurs with a circumferential dressing. So once we relieve that, that makes a huge difference and the compartment pressure can drop. When we've done that, we assess for pain on passive stretch. But remember, from now on, to consider the two-point light touch discrimination. And if these signs are positive, then yes, we've got compartment syndrome. If they're negative, <clears throat> then what we do, as uh, this was uh, pointed out earlier in the talk, was to elevate the limb and give them strong analgesia. Make a no note of the time, come back in about 20 minutes or 30 minutes, reassess the limb. If the patient has pain and passive stretch, yes, compartment. If not, then it's unlikely to be so. So that's the uh, dummies algorithm, which uh, I even practice to date uh, uh, in uh, diagnosing a compartment syndrome. Do you do anything different, uh, Amir? Um, I think one thing that I do slightly differently, which is elevation. Now, um, you mentioned about the diastolic blood pressure and how important that is. <clears throat> now, if we elevate a limb, we lower the blood pressure within that limb. So actually, it uh, the pressure in the compartment may not change, but if we elevate, I'd be worried that we're decreasing the um, diastolic pressure within that limb. And so actually, it's making the risk of compartment syndrome becoming clinically significant um, higher. So mm -hmm. I tend to keep the limb at the same level as the rest of the body rather than elevating it or uh, keeping it dependent. Okay, but that, that's, that's a... it. Otherwise, I do everything exactly the same as you. Okay, that's a fair point uh, because you're trying to reduce the, well, essentially we end up reducing the diastolic pressure by elevating the limb. So the difference between the diastolic and the, uh, intracompartmental pressure tends to deviate and you're, you're seeing it could compound compartment syndrome. It's a dogma we've all grown up with that when there is swelling, elevate the limb. So yes, uh, fair point there. Omar has asked a question, which is earliest? Uh, Omar, I hope that's the, the answer has uh, been given is two-point discrimination. I suspect that was your uh, uh, question. Ayman's asking us another question. If the patient has compartment syndrome in the foot and not responding to narcotics, is it okay to leave the patient in pain? 
uh, yes, I mean, I, I agree, but uh, I think uh, Amir has uh, other thoughts. He would go ahead and uh, uh, decompress that. Uh, well, it, it, I think I think it, it depends. Yeah, if I was in the situation where there is uh, where there are fractures underneath and the patient's in pain, then um, you know, especially if opiates are not helping, then what I would do is I would just block the popliteal nerve and just just basically mask the pain so that the patient can get through that uh, uh, sort of period of, of excruciating pain without having to become sort of without having to take large uh, doses of opiates um, but you know I, I've, I've got my sort of uh, logic for how I go about with uh, decision making for compartment syndrome and it would still uh, be dependent on whether I'm going to expose uh, um, bone underneath um, you know it, it's interesting that you know when we look at the tibia it's it's, it's slightly different but uh, um, yeah so I, I think uh, it's a very important point which is being made here we're focusing when you talk about the foot uh, Amir is talking about blocking the uh, uh, pain with a nerve block because if it comes out uh, higher up in the limb, we do not use nerve blocks as we don't want to mask the symptoms. So yes, if there is a fracture, he's decided he doesn't want to open it, come what may, he just wants to dull the patient's pain, so he's blocking the, uh, giving the patient a block. Okay, so let's talk a bit about pressure monitoring, these adjuncts to diagnosis. So it's extremely important to have a very clear uh, algorithm as we've discussed, and you decide pretty much on your clinical diagnosis whether this patient has compartment syndrome or not. In some instances, pressure monitoring might come into its own, uh, especially in patients who have altered consciousness or children following surgery where they have continuous pressure monitoring applied. It's controversial because more than 50% of orthopedic surgeons don't use this. This is from an American uh, JBJS article uh, which had uh, essentially sent out questionnaires to orthopedic surgeons and found that a large uh, number don't actually use uh, pressure monitoring. And I think that's replicated in our clinical practice as well. Um, the principles of pressure monitoring are that ischemia occurs when the perfusion pressure is more than the capillary pressure. And that usually is a 25 millimeter or 30 millimeter threshold. And death of the mus muscle occurs when the diastolic pressure minus the intracompartmental pressure, when you minus the two, uh, it's less than 30 millimeters. <clears throat> Excuse me. So in children, it's important if you're going to consider pressure monitoring, not to use the diastolic pressure because they tend to have a spuriously elevated diastolic pressure. It's not very uh, reliable. So we need to use the mean arterial uh, blood pressure. And remember, the distal pulses are not uh, going to give us any uh, additional benefit here. So we've got two methods. This is a common MCQ in the FRCS and the board exams. You've got your direct pressure method and your delta pressure method when you're examining with uh, the pressure devices. If you stick a needle into the patient's compartment and the intracompartment pressure is more than 30 millimeters, that's compartment syndrome diagnosed. That's direct pressure method. Okay, there's no uh, subtracting and things like that. The delta pressure method is a bit more um, uh, sensitive to an extent and specific because you're looking at the difference between the diastolic blood pressure and the compartment pressure. So we stick a needle into the patient. Let's say we get the compartment pressure to be 40 and the patient's blood pressure is 90 then the difference between the dis sorry the diastolic blood pressure is 90 then the difference 90 minus 40 is 50 millimeters so that difference is not less than 30 millimeters of mercury so i.e this patient does not have compartment syndrome that's how you uh, work out the uh, indirect method or the delta pressure method <clears throat> so here is a picture showing you the uh, striker has got this uh, a device which is commonly used and some tips on if you're using these you've got to take at least two or three measurements and when you first stick the needle into the muscle compartment you find sometimes that the pressure is off the charts and that's a false reading because your needle is sometimes blocked and it tends to hit uh, tissue and that gives uh, it's a quite a sensitive instrument so one way to overcome that is to just flush half a mil or one mil of uh, saline through the needle whilst it's in the compartment and that tends to give you a better reading once uh, that's come uh, that's been done and you put your needle perpendicular to the uh, long axis of that limb you 
you take a measurement close to the fracture and you take a measurement away from the fracture. Here is an example um, of the reading. It's 76 millimeters of mercury. Let's say this patient's uh, diastolic blood pressure is 90. The difference is 14. It's less than 30 millimeters. So this patient has compartment syndrome. So I hope that's clear to everyone that if we do map monitor, this is the way we do, do so. Okay, which brings us to this uh, question of continuous versus intermittent monitoring. And uh, Amir alluded to this earlier in that uh, case example. Um, this is a paper from McQueen et al. in the uh, JBGS where they looked at 25 patients with tibial fractures and acute compartment syndrome. This was diagnosed. What they didn't then did was they subdivided this group into those who had been uh, monitored continuously. Their pressure was monitored continuously, and that was 13 patients. They had a mean delay from injury to fasciotomy of 16 hours with no long-term sequelae. The other group, which had been uh, who had had their pressure monitoring done intermittently, there were a total of 12 in that group, and the mean delay from injury to fasciotomy was 32 hours. So it took a lot longer to diagnose them because they were being uh, looked at intermittently with regards to monitoring for the pressure. And 10 out of these had significant weakness, contracture, and delayed union. So the take home message is if you decide to monitor pressure, it's probably better to do a continuous monitoring because it's much more reliable. You pick up the compartment syndrome a lot earlier versus intermittent. Which brings us to fasciotomies. Now it's a huge topic to cover. Uh, but we're going to go with where the odds are. The chances of us picking up a compartment syndrome is most likely in a tibia, so we're going to deep dive and focus on that. <clears throat> the principle is that if you, risk, if you decompress within 12 hours, you've got normal function restored. But beyond 12 hour, hours, you have uh, only an 8% chance of restoring normal function. So there's a significantly increased risk of uh, complications if you've waited for 12 hours uh, to decompress someone's limb. So this was uh, another paper from the American JBJS, which looked at uh, the long-term results following fasciotomies. And what we've got to understand is that these don't come without risk. Even if we pick up compartment syndrome early and we do a fasciotomy, you've got significant complications which can occur. 15% of these patients had rest pain. 27% had pain with exertion. <clears throat> Almost 50% had decreased range of movement and sensation, long-term follow-up at seven years. and close to 40% of fasciotomy wounds will get infected. So yes, we've got to act fairly aggressively and quickly when we pick these up, but bear in mind that these do come with their uh, host of complications. <clears throat> Excuse me. So here is uh, a picture from the uh, BOA BAPRIS guidelines, which we have uh, discussed before, and we're going to go through this once more because it's crucial. The, the picture on your left with the uh, markings on the leg is the green, the dotted green lines are the tibial border. You've got your posterior medial border of the tibia and you've got your antra, the iliac, sorry, the tibial crest. On either side, those blue lines are the fasciotomy lines. So it's important for us to know where to make our fasciotomy incisions. Your posterior medial fasciotomy line is one finger breadth posterior to the posterior medial edge of the tibia. So you feel the edge of the tibia, you mark it out and one finger breadth posterior to that. You don't want to go any uh, more posterior than that because that ends up with damaging the perforators of Boyd, which, as you can see, are marked out with those X's uh, in that picture. Your anterolateral fasciotomy line, which is what we will use to decompress the anterior compartment and the lateral perineal compartment, is one and a half finger breadth from the uh, crest of the tibia on the lateral aspect. So once you've marked those out, there was a question asked in the previous uh, talk about how long these fasciotomy lines should be. And the answer to that is uh, as long as it, uh, you know, you can never be too long. So you want to feel the crest, you know, that flare of the proximal tibia. And right at that flare, you want to start your proximal most uh, uh, incision and go all the way down to the malleolar. Okay, so no one's going to criticize us for making long fasciotomy uh, incisions. So don't be afraid to uh, flate open. What we will be criticized for is making them smaller than uh, needed. So just go, go big. So here's a, an axial view. We've got our tibia and fibula in white there, and the subcutaneous border of the tibia marked out in that arrow. 
So let's go through step by step how we're going to decompress this. That's our posterior medial incision, which is a finger breadth behind the medial edge of the tibia and the anterolateral incision highlighted in blue there. So let's start with decompressing the posterior and the deep uh, and superficial compartments. So once we've made that incision and it's all the way along the length of that tibia, the first structure you're going to encounter is the deep fascia to the superficial compartment, which we're going to go through. And then it's important because a lot of times we go in and uh, do a fasciotomy, but when we've gone back for a second look, <clears throat> excuse me, uh, and someone's done that fasciotomy, you, you tend to see that they have not actually decompressed that deep compartment. They've gone in and opened up that superficial compartment. So it's really crucial to identify that fascia between the deep and superficial compartment, which is highlighted in that bright green or yellow, and open that up. Once we open that up, we can decompress that deep compartment there, that shaded area, and the superficial compartment. So make sure that we go through that deep fascia separating the superficial and deep compartments. When it comes to the anterolateral uh, incision to decompress the uh, anterior and lateral compartments, um, when I was a young trainee, uh, I used to struggle to actually figure out how this works. And it took me a couple of them to actually work out how this is done. So this is what, so you cut through, you make your long longitudinal incision and you come to the deep fascia of the anterior compartment. That's that line there. We go through that and we're pretty much, it's pretty easy to open up that anterior compartment. Now the trick is getting through that incision to the lateral compartment. You've got to put a, an army navy or a deep uh, retractor into your skin fold there and get to that intermuscular septum between the anterior and lateral compartment. You've got to identify that, and that's uh, easier said than done. You've actively got to look for that. Once you've done that, you incise that through its length, and you can start seeing your perineal muscles sort of bulging out. So then you decompress your anterior and your lateral compartment. So we've got to make sure that all four compartments are decompressed, and that's, uh, uh, that's, that's a step-by-step -step approach I take in my mind when I'm doing uh, a decompression. So this is uh, one of uh, Amir's uh, patients, patient who has had, you can see the full length of the leg has been opened up. And this is how the muscle is pretty, uh, it sort of bulges out as all of us have seen. Now you've got to consider what you're going to do with muscle, which is dead. You're going to debride because you don't want to leave any dead tissue in there, but it's a bit of a fine balance. We'll tease this out in uh, further during this uh, talk with uh, Amir. The question is, how do we close? So obviously, we're not going to close the first uh, stage, but it's uh, your options are to put a back dressing on or to use this uh, Roman sandal or shoelace technique. Uh, I find this very useful. Amir, do you use this? I think you do, right? I have used it in the past, but uh, I must say that more recently, uh, I've uh, gone for uh, the tactic of closing one of the wounds and then getting the plastic surgeons to split skin graft the other wound uh, just as a means of getting one you know, the wound that's going to expose the bone most i want to close that quickly so you primarily then, close one of the wounds yes okay but so, only uh, of course if there's, enough, if there's enough soft tissue laxity sure. to allow that to happen sure so the, so that's that's an absolutely uh, fair way of doing that because you want to just try to minimize the amount of morbidity this patient is going to have, have with possible skin grafts in the future. Uh, uh, word of caution, because if your compartment's not looking very healthy, you're obviously going to come back and look at it for a second look. So it may not be, I'm sure you don't close uh, in those instances, correct? No, absolutely. Yeah. yeah. Uh, so this is where you use these vascular elastic loops or bands and you just sort of string them along and keep uh, using staples to close it works really well and you can see as you can see here this wound on the right hand side has a fairly wide uh, diameter and as you keep closing it can narrow you can sort of use tension to close this down uh, vac dressings work equally well a <clears throat> uh, quick word on chronic exertion compartment syndrome before we end um, you've got this is quite a tricky one um, because you've got to use pressure monitoring to uh, identify it. And uh, it is diagnosed by one of the following findings. If you've got a pre-exercise pressure of 15 millimeters of gra or greater, or you've got a one minute post-exercise pressure of 30 millimeters or greater, or a five minute post-exercise pressure of 20 minutes or greater. Now, it's important to uh, diagnose this with pressure monitoring, especially if you're going to go down the, the route of decompressing these patients, because you need to have some medical legal backing for this. Uh, 
before we uh, go in. Um, do you do this any different, uh, Amir? Uh, yeah, the difficulty is um, getting the patients to exercise enough. So in the end, what happens is I get the patients running up and down the stairs uh, outside the theatre block, and then I get them to come into theatre. And it sounds quite comical, but they come into theatre and then I measure the pressures. Um, and then if their pressures are high, then they go on to have surgery. Yeah. We've got another question from Omar. Uh, how to deal with a diabetic patient? Uh, Amir, do you want to take this one? Well, well that is Not a difficult chronic, uh, question. Exertional. It's for the uh, compartment syndrome per se, I take it. Right. Um, essentially, when you've got somebody who's uh, diabetic, and I, I take it almost talking about someone with a glove and stocking type distribution of neuropathy, um, they're going to be affected in their foot first by the neuropathy. Um, it's not often that you you actually have someone's neuropathy extending up to the knee level. Um, so it's a uh, notional problem, but in reality, you know, if someone's got compartment syndrome, they will feel it, even if they are diabetic and they've got some uh, and they've got uh, 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 neuropathy as a complication of the diabetes. So I, I think it, it's not really a, an issue, but it's an interesting question. Uh, I hope that's answered your question. Feel free to follow up with uh, any uh, further questions if you've got there, uh, them, Omar. The uh, other possibility you've got to consider is uh, infection, but I think you've got to open up the compartment because uh, rhabdomyolysis uh, with uh, chronic renal failure can have its uh, own uh, complications. Okay, so with regards to exertional compartment syndrome, actually the outcomes are very good. Uh, the evidence and literature suggests 87% to 100% report full return to uh, exercise with no pain. And these are, uh, I tend to do with two small mini incisions, and it's usually the ant anterior anterolateral compartments which are compromised, not the posterior. So uh, one five centimeter incision at the top end of the leg and one five centimeter incision at the bottom. And I tend to use a scissor to get the two uh, ends to meet through that. Uh, do you do uh, anything different, Amir? Um, what I tend to do, because it, it, it's the exertional compartment syndrome is affecting the area of the limb where there's muscle belly. Um, I do it very sim in a very similar way to the way you do it. But a tip that I, I can give people is that go to your general surgical theatre and borrow one of their laparoscopic scissors. Mm -hmm. Laparoscopic scissors, you know, they're that long. And you can actually, uh, and the other thing that you can borrow is a, uh, a rigid bronchoscope. So what I do is I pass the rigid bronchoscope down uh, down a tunnel, and then I can use the uh, laparoscopic scissors to cut the fascia under direct vision. Uh, and I, I find it, it may not be any more effective, but I find it very satisfying as an operation to be able to see exactly what I'm doing. There's a there's a. Uh, surgical tip and trick paper, their myoscopic release for uh, chronic exertion compartment syndrome. Okay, thanks, man. Okay, quick summary. So, clinical examination is key. Remember the two point uh, light touch discrimination. Uh, when in doubt, decompress. There's no point humming and eyeing. Uh, if we've got a suspicion, we just go ahead and decompress, as we all know. An important point to note is that once we've decompressed, we've got to monitor the urine output and the renal function, which is something as surgeons we can sometimes uh, ha you know, get, take our eye off. And it's very important from a medical legal perspective to document clearly when we see a fracture that this patient has no compartment syndrome at present, because there's always the possibility of an evolving compartment syndrome. Uh, it is a, it's a big problem because there's a massive burden uh, both to the patient and the community, because once we miss it, there are mu multiple trips back and forth, um, you know, with loss of uh, limb function. If you've got any questions on this, please free to use the chat uh, um, box. And I mean, do you have anything further to add on this topic before we jump into well, our second ask, case? Ask you a question. I'll just want to ask you a question about, you quoted the paper by uh, Margaret McQueen uh, looking at 25 patients. Now, you said that half of them were monitored continuously mm -hmm. and half of them were monitored intermittently. Mm -hmm. How did they go about monitoring them continuously? Because this, this is the, the problem that most of us have. Yeah. Um, because 
So, so they, they, they've not actually specified their uh, protocol of how they've just said it's monitored continuously. But from my experience with the pediatric uh, group in Alderhey in Liverpool, uh, they tend to stick uh, a monitor in. They've got a device where they stick it in and they attach it with uh, uh, plaster. So it stays, you know, perpendicular to the uh, limb. Uh, and they have, it is a bit of a fiddle because you can uh, uh, lose the monitoring and it starts alarming and you have to go back and just adjust. But it's usually used in children who have had uh, a block given to them and they don't want to uh, miss the compartment syndrome post uh, multi level surgery and application of frames and things to that effect. Yeah. I, I think another alternative is to use uh, um, an arterial monitor. Mm -hmm. So uh, the, the, the anaesthetist will have, uh, will be able to connect a, a catheter to the uh, arterial monitor so instead of measuring the arterial pressure it can measure the compartment pressure and that's very sensitive as well um i think you know that that's really the key from that paper isn't it that if you measure them continuously you look at you can see the trend so you, you can see that if the pressure is going up that's what should ring the panic bells absolutely yes that's a, that's a good point um okay do you want to uh Talk us through this uh, case now. Okay, so this is our second case, and this uh, is a 26 year old man, and uh, he's been playing football, he's been tackled, and he's gone over on his leg, and he's got this uh, spiral fracture of his tibia and fibula. So let's ask the question spiral fractures, they're low energy injuries. And we always think of compartment syndrome as occurring with a high energy injury. Can you get compartment syndrome with a spiral fracture? So compartment syndrome does not occur with spiral fractures. So we've got the majority of the audience seems to have gone with false. So yes, it does occur with spiral fractures. Um, that's the right answer, isn't it? Yes, yes. So uh, I, I think the, the key thing is that in older people, um, the amount of space within the compartments uh, compared to the volume of their muscle mass uh, means that there's a lot more laxity. But in younger men, uh, the uh, ratio of the, the muscle uh, volume compared to the uh, compartment volume is really high. So it doesn't take very much for a young muscular man uh, to uh, get compartment syndrome from a relatively low energy injury like this. So I, I think that, that was that was the point that I thought would be worth making uh, with this. Sure. So sure. let's... Just, uh, just uh, staying with that point, um, with right. regards to where uh, in a tibial fracture, where, uh, which level of fracture has the highest risk of compartment syndrome as you say mid diaphyseal fractures have a much higher risk because there's more muscle mass there compared to a distal third fracture because you we hardly ever see compartment syndrome with the distal third fracture do we that's right i mean it's it's po theoretically possible but it's very rare, very rare. yeah okay okay so the next question is um he needs more and more morphine and the pain is not being controlled by his pain. So the question is, what, what should we do? Should we release the plaster and reassess him? Or should we just say, you know, he's got compartment syndrome, let's decompress him now? Okay, so this is actually, a, on face value, this question is pretty straightforward. Do you go ahead and decompress or do you release and uh, reassess? Almost everyone seems to uh, go with the option one, which is uh, release the plaster down to skin and reassess, which is the algorithm we discussed. Now, if we just look at that in a bit more detail, Amir, let's say we've released the plaster down to skin, so don't leave even a small film of cotton on that skin, and you don't elevate the limb, you, you give them some analgesia. At what point do you come back and reassess this patient, and how frequently do you reassess this patient? Or is there ever a, an instance where you see the foot and you say, no, we've got to go. Let's not reassess. Let's just go and decompress now. 
Um, I, I would say, you know, in a situation like this, uh, like you, I, I would be feeling very, very nervous and I'd be going back at, at least every 30 minutes to reassess the patient. And if their symptoms were getting worse, um, I, I, I would actually um, uh, check for the uh, first web space because that's something that's often... Uh, a, a subtle sign that there's compartment syndrome there because as you said before the anterolateral compartment is the compartment that develops compartment syndrome the most frequently and the deep peroneal nerve if that's being um, uh, put under pressure in the uh, in the anterior compartment then the first web space may be where I can uh, feel um, uh, if, uh, be able to detect the compartment syndrome first. So I, I'd be using all these different um, methods of assessment to try to come to a decision. Um, but as I said before, I'd still feel pretty nervous about it. Okay. We've got a question from Ayman. Uh, can you please re-explain why not elevating the leg is better? Okay. So um, Rahil's talked to you about the concept of delta P. So delta P is the, the difference between the pressure in your compartment and the pressure in your uh, of your diastolic blood pressure. So the now, diastolic blood pressure yeah. minus the compartment intracompartmental pressure. Yeah. So if you've got somebody whose diastolic pressure is 80 and your uh, compartment pressure is 25, then delta P is quite large. And so you may be loath to decompress them. But if you've got somebody who has, for some reason, either because they've been losing blood or for any other reason, they might have a low blood pressure and their, systolic, uh, their diastolic pressure is only 50 and you have uh, a, a compartment pressure of 25, now delta P is less than 30. And so uh, they have got uh, a, a, a compartment syndrome, which is uh, threatening their limb. Now, if you elevate the limb, you're actually going to decrease the uh, blood pressure within that leg. And so there's a risk that you're going to lower their diastolic pressure and bring it closer to uh, less than 30 from the uh, compartment pressure. Whereas if you keep it level, then you're not the diastolic blood pressure. So it may be that much further away from the uh, compartment pressure. Does, does that make sense? I mean, I'm in, um, any... Say I. Okay. Ice compression and it's helped to decrease grade. So Iman's got that. So Omar is asking us about ice compression it's helped to decrease compartment uh, pressure. That's a good one. So what does ice what do essentially you... do? It vasoconstricts. Mm -hmm. would, would you use ice as a, as a means of uh, combating uh, the risk of compartment pressure? So I've actually never used it, to be honest. Uh, I can yes. see it makes sense, but uh, I've never used uh, a bag of ice or frozen peas or you know things like, to that effect uh, to reduce compartment I think pressure. That... Even if you use it, the problem is that when you then take the ice away, you get a reactive hyperemia. So, so actually, uh, it may work temporarily, but then when you take it away again, because you can't keep leave it on forever, it may then cause a reactive hyperemia and make things worse again. So, uh, it's an interesting you, point. I, like you, yeah, I've never used I've never used ice for that reason. Yeah. So. Uh, when it comes down to uh, diagnosing and taking a patient to theater, Amir, have you at any point in time taken down this dressing, had a look and said, we need to go now? Or do you always tend to just hold back for a bit, reassess the patient? What's your uh, usual go-to? I know well, very I think patient that... to patient, but let's say you see a patient, it looks firm, it looks woody, he's got passive stretch. Would you still give them some analgesia and just because the snapshot view you're having and come back in 20 minutes? I, th I think that if the all the various factors 
uh, and if they're woody and, and, and swollen and got pain and passive step stretching, then there's no point in waiting to reassess. You've made your diagnosis and you've got to decompress them as soon as possible. Great. I think that's I think, the take you know, message. The, so the yes, point of uh, this question is that if you if you if you uh, release the plaster and things get better, or those symptoms, those other factors are not present, then you should mm -hmm. wait and reassess. But sure. if you've got enough evidence that they've got compartment syndrome, I think you've just got to go for it. Great. Okay, so let's move on to the, the next slide. So the pain seems to settle, but then you notice that there's altered sensation in the first web space. What are we going to do? So let's uh, ask the audience again. So bearing in mind that you've got a high, we've discussed in the talk, there's 40% uh, infection rates with fasciotomies. You've got all these other complications. Would you go ahead and decompress or would you observe? I think I'm swinging the vote there. Hmm. I, I think this is a difficult question mm -hmm. to answer. Okay. And um, you, know, you will find that um, there will be lots of experienced people who will have different ideas about this. So there's no one definite right or wrong. Uh, I think, as you said before, you've just got to document what you found and you know, reasoning for making your decision. Um, what would you do if, if they've got altered sensation in the first web space? What would that make you worry about? So that, that, that as we've discussed, is one of the earliest signs of compartment. So obviously this patient has a compartment syndrome. Uh, he's probably, he or she is probably on that, uh, on balance. We don't know which way they're going to swing. If the pain is better, I certainly would just wait and observe. I wouldn't dive in. Uh, but at the first hint that uh, they're sort of deteriorating, I would take the patient to uh, theatre. Yeah. So, so really, it's um, it's a dynamic situation, isn't it? You you can't just make a decision and forget about it. You can't make a decision and go home. You've got to make a decision for that moment, and then thirty minutes later, have a look again and reassess. And only if it's continuously um, pointing towards it not being compartment syndrome would you leave them. But any uh, suggestion that it's compartment syndrome you're going to decompress. So, uh, it's interesting that most people say that they would continue to observe. So that's uh, of the, the people who've answered, 82% uh, have said that they would observe and two people have said that they would decompress. And I would say that actually there is no right answer and if you decompress no, I don't think anyone would uh, criticise you. If you continue to observe, you've committed yourself to reassessing them again, you know, within 30 minutes. Yeah. Okay. So, now, this is a, the type of picture that you don't want to see. So, uh, this is one of my patients, and the fasciotomy have been performed and underneath there is dead muscle and it's one of the most heartbreaking um, times as a surgeon when you open up someone's leg especially someone who's young and the muscle is dead underneath and the question is what are we going to do with that dead muscle we're we going to close the wound up and treat it like you might do in the foot and just let it die and um, you know, try and deal with the consequences afterwards, or are you going to debride that dead muscle and take away that dead muscle, or are you going to say, well, this is this leg is uh, really beyond salvage, and they need to have an amputation. So, what what would you do, Rahil, in this situation where you've got dead muscle? So this is a tricky one, Amir, but I actually think it comes down to whether this patient has a fracture underneath or not, because it's going to change. Uh, what I do tremendously then, because if there is a fracture, then there is no, um, there's no doubt you've got to debride all the uh, dead tissue there. But if there is no fracture and this is a soft tissue injury, which has contributed to compartment syndrome or a vascular injury, then 
the gut instinct is to debride all muscles. Um, I know there is a school of thought uh, that you leave and let it scar up and fibros. Um, so it, it's a tricky one. I would hope there's a fracture because then it makes my life easy. Hmm. Yeah, I, I, I agree. You know, again, you know, there isn't definitely a right answer. Um, you've got dead muscle, and once you've opened them up, you know, your concern is that if you've got dead muscle, that's going to become infected. I, I think uh, it's the, certainly the, the, be... the, uh, the answer to, to go away with, particularly for the exams, is that debride it because you don't want to open yes. yourself up to controversy. Because once you leave muscle which is dead in, you're causing rhabdomyolysis, you're causing renal complications. So uh, the easy and the safe thing to do would be to debride all, all muscle. We don't want to get into controversi controversies wherein you leave stuff in as soft tissue to, to scar up. Would you agree with that? Absolutely. And, and also, if you've got necrotic tissue, that, you know, it, it's uh, basically uh, a, fo a, a possible focus for infection. So you've got to debride until you get back to bleeding healthy tissue again. And unfortunately, that might be that you have to empty the whole compartment. Um, but that's what's necessary uh, in this situation. And, and so at some point in your career, in, in everyone's career, they will come across a missed compartment syndrome and they will need to make this decision. And it's, it's very difficult. Um, what I think is really useful is to speak to colleagues and to actually have several people there in the operating theatre. So if, you, if I was to come across this situation, I wouldn't make a decision on my own. I would be ringing up Rahil or I would be ringing up my other colleagues and saying, I'd like you to come, have a look and let's share the decision making and share the responsibility. Um, and make it rational because in this situation it's very easy to become emotional and to uh, to overthink things and sometimes you need someone from the outside a fresh pair of eyes Absolutely. or you know, you know sound ahead to come and sort of talk sense so it's always useful to have colleagues come and join you in the theater in this situation and sort of make a joint decision absolutely uh, I'm just sharing a question with the audience. Uh, I'd like you to answer. Uh, while, while we're doing that, Amir, do you want to summarize some key take home principles for the talk? Okay, so I, I think Rahil has given you a really succinct um, you know, uh, and well honed talk on compartment syndrome. I, I'm hoping that uh, what you're going to take home is a good idea of what compartment syndrome is, what causes it, and um, what uh, how you've got a simple algorithm to follow, which is going to give you a a, a, a way of making decisions which are defensible and rational, and also you know, showing you where your responsibility lies. And Rahil's also talked to you about um, the lower limb uh, fasciotomies how to make them and giving you some sort of key surgical tips uh, and i think you know the other thing that people should take home is that this isn't an easy situation and you shouldn't uh, always have to make these decisions on your own and share the responsibility um so that uh, you know you know that you're making the right decision for that patient at that time Thanks, Amit. That's, that's uh, well put, I think. We, we asked the question, how many of the audience have done a decompression as a primary surgeon? Uh, and hopefully that answer um, there, even if you've not done it as a primary surgeon, uh, you've got some key take-home tips on how to decompress the uh, four compartments of the leg. Uh, and that we're going to also push to you a, a link which I'd like to share with you on, this is actually uh, on the one controversial thing we discussed. It's coming up on your chat icon. It's the controversies with foot compartment syndrome. It's a, it's a short read, it's a, it's a nice read. Uh, have a look at it, it's all evidence-based. Uh, you can download that uh, PDF through the chat and hopefully that will uh, give you some additional uh, 
things to mull over as well. Uh, Amir, any anything else? Any questions from the audience? Please do uh, share. Omar has something. I'm sorry to bother you. How to deal with a neglected patient more than 24 hours? Are you treating them with medical treatment or start uh, a decompression? Okay, so uh, I think this is uh, an interesting one before we round up. How do you deal with a missed compartment syndrome when you 24 hours down the line? So this patient's developed compartment syndrome and now you're looking at him the next day. I think that uh, 24 hours is a difficult time because I, I still think at 24 hours there's a role for fasciotomy. But you know, if you get to say, if you think that you've missed a compartment syndrome by 72 hours, then you know it's more controversial about going in there and debriding because you've already missed the boat and um, the all the complications that were going to happen are, you know are, are, are already uh, already occurred you know that you've you've got that muscle death uh, 24 hours I still think there's a role for fasciotomy because you may have still uh, viable tissue which you can um, uh, salvage. Uh, from becoming necrotic and and, uh, and ischemic, um, th there is no right. uh, clear right. timetable. Uh, you know, there is no right and wrong answer for this. Um, but uh, in my experience, at 24 hours, you know, there's still room there for salvage. At 72 hours, you know, really, it, it's too late. What What do you think, Rahil? I think I agree with you, Amir. As long as uh the patient's still feeling pain, we've not missed the boat. Yeah. So uh, I hope you found that uh, topic and talk useful. We've uh, just uploaded uh, something for you to download. Um, feel free to do so. It's a bit of additional reading material. Uh, next week, we're going to be discussing damage control orthopedics, uh, which is an interesting topic. And uh, hopefully, we'll, uh, we'll meet again. And uh, the following uh, month we're going to be having uh, the theme is going to be foot and ankle and we'll take it uh, we'll send send across flyers as to topics we're going to be uh, dealing with uh, any final questions before we round up excellent Amir thank you very much once again look forward to seeing you next week thank you Rahil and uh, I look forward to seeing you for the damage control next week take care bye bye